This is Buenos Aires, where after almost 40 years of political turbulence, democracy has triumphed and joy is in the air. In the first election in a decade, Raul Alfonsín and his radical union party was on the way to outvoting the traditional Peronists. For the first time since it was founded by Juan Perón 38 years ago, the Peronist party was about to lose a free general election. And Alfonsín was poised to do what no other politician had been able to do in that time. He was about to break the mystique of Perón, who even after his death 10 years ago, had remained the dominant figure in Argentine politics. <laughs> Alfonsín's victory would also bring to an end the military regime that had ruled for almost eight stormy years. It was a regime that added a bitter chapter to the history of a country that has always passionately defended its sovereignty. But the legacy of Argentina's struggle really goes back to the arrival into the River Plate of a Spanish expedition whose leaders were promptly attacked and killed by local Indians. As the years passed, other Spanish explorers landed on Argentine shores. The early colony was neglected by the Spanish, however, and when Napoleon invaded Spain and imprisoned the king, the people of Argentina set up their own government. Many times, Spain tried to reclaim the rebel colony, but the Argentines had found themselves a leader. Jose de San Martín, a soldier who is now a national hero. But winds of change again have come to the South American giant. And at such an historic time, with a new leader and a new direction, we were about to find out for ourselves what makes the new Argentina tick. Ours was an expedition of discovery, 5,000 miles from Cape Town to the fourth largest country on the American continent. Three weeks journey by sea from Duncan Dock to Rio de la Plata. River Plate leads us to Buenos Aires, once the fort between the hinterland and the sea, now one of the world's most exotic places. This is the capital city that created the tango and the traffic jam. Here, 10 million people have an ongoing love affair with a city. This is a place where charm and chutzpah go hand in hand, where not only conversation, but a whole world of communication revolves around the cafes, the coffee bars, the sidewalk restaurants, all 10,000 of them. From the time of the Spanish conquest, Europe has played a big part in the human development of Argentina. Its roots and customs are basically European, so are the characteristics of its people. Most of the immigrants who arrived at the turn of the century were, of course, Spaniards and Italians. But many came from Britain, Germany, France, and more recently, Southeast Asia, people driven from their native lands by the specter of war. And in Commodoro Rivadavia, in the Patagonian South, we even found Argentines of Africana Trekker stock. All were aware of the call of the Constitution, which welcomes anyone in the world who wishes to reside on the soil of Argentina. Often they live in ethnic suburbs, each bearing the stamp of national characteristics. However diverse their backgrounds may be, they are not a nation apart. They call themselves porteños, people of the port city.
In the suburb of Martinez, about 30 kilometers from the center of the city, we met the Carillo family. They are what we might call middle-class porteños. They are the soul of this sprawling city of 10 million people. As with most Argentine households, the family bond is strong. Every meal at the Carillos is a three-generation affair. This family is one of the lucky ones. They have come unscathed through the dark days of Argentina's political traumas. Others are still caught up in the nightmares of the past. These are the parents, the sons, the daughters of the desaparecidos, the missing ones. Thousands, possibly tens of thousands, of men, women and children who, as alleged enemies of the state, disappeared under the military government of Argentina in the late 1970s. Now, as painful as are the memories, as agonizing as the process of discovery may prove to be, thousands of Argentine citizens are at last in a position to learn the fate of their kin. The confirmation of the worst fears about the thousands who went missing during the abductions is probably the biggest step Argentina is taking towards national rehabilitation. The country has been haunted for years by the nightmare of the desaparecidos. Even the new art of Argentina speaks eloquently out of an awareness of that grim past. This exhibition by one of the country's leading artists, Rachel Fauna, is a litany of rage and remorse for the deeds that have been perpetrated in the ambiguity of so-called national interest. Her forms are grotesque and primitive, reflecting a grey, disillusioned earth. Fauna's paintings are a lament on canvas. They cry for Argentina. However, that was yesterday. Today, Argentina is in love with the future, and the future rests with the young people. Paz Carrillo goes to a girls' state school near her home. Here, as it is throughout the country, education has always remained a national priority, which is why Argentina can boast a literacy rate of 94%, certainly the highest in Latin America. Senor Fernando Carillo travels to his city office by means of a transport system which is almost uncannily British. But that's not surprising, as the rail system in Argentina was taken over from Britain and included not only the rolling stock, but the entire design, right down to the commuter trains and stations. The underground system could be the London subway, except that here, each station is the responsibility of a provincial authority. Hand-painted murals predominate. The city station could be Paddington, as Signor Carillo heads for the last lap to his office. The choice is either by bus or taxi. Travelling by cab in Buenos Aires is fine, so long as you do not look out of the window. It might spoil your day. 
The rules of the road in this city have yet to be written. The general pace appears to be a headlong merry-go-round. Officially, it's described as a happy nonchalance. And yet, astonishingly, there are very few serious road accidents here. The theory seems to be that the wilder you drive, the least likely you are to collide. And around that frenzied central city area, the suburban pulse beats in its steady, traditional way. Here are the residential contrasts of old and new, and rich and not so rich. Where, in the well-to-do suburbs of old Spanish and colorful Italian designs, mingle with contemporary European. This is where antiquity has its price, and history is padlocked against intruders. flamboyant do-it-yourself painters create their own particular masterpieces out of backstreet drabness. And then there are the statues. Its largely Latin descent and its wealth of memory makes Buenos Aires naturally in love with statues. is where the love affair really blooms. This is the time of the Levanta, the pickup, with all the panache in the world, when the young Porteños parade with their sweethearts and friends, and for a while, the streets of Buenos Aires are theirs as they go into a ritual that's as old as Adam and Eve. Others, the demands of living in the capital city of a country that has an inflation rate of 1,000% and rising are rather more important than a fashionable stroll in the street. When Mrs. Carrillo shops in the supermarket, she buys when she can and where she can, in the knowledge that almost everything she's purchased will be higher in price at the end of the month. The Argentine peso is similar to the Italian lira. Every month it seems to add a couple of noughts. Even at the vegetable market, she has to watch the prices rise almost as fast as she can raise the money to buy the goods. We find in the center of Buenos Aires, however, one market that never fears the fluctuations of price. This is Argentina's long-standing hallmark of success, the cattle auction. <laughs> 
thriving on the magnificent prairies, local beef breeds now total well over 60 million. Meat exports, principally beef and its sub-products, have by long tradition been one of the pillars of the country's overseas trade. But it was the advent of refrigeration to Argentina more than a hundred years ago that changed the country's pampas cornucopia of cattle and agricultural produce into real wealth. An industrial new world began to rise on the foundations of the old. Buenos Aires was the focal point for this change, and today the city reflects the architectural influences that its progress absorbed. We can see that the first notable impact was that of the French. The famous opera house is an example of classic Italian design. Today in Buenos Aires, skyscrapers of concrete and steel announce the affluence of Argentina. While the architecture of the past remains constant as a reminder of its cultural legacy, and while the citizens of the city go about enjoying their wealth with healthy Latin enthusiasm. A nation of horsemen, the Argentines are great lovers of turf racing, a sport with which they share close ties with South Africa. A number of Argentine horses are either in stud or training and racing in South Africa. And in the current racing lineup, one of the best fillies that we've ever seen, the winner of the 1983 Durban July. Tecla Bluff is an import from Argentine stables. a game which is as close to the Argentine character as the gaucho is to the pampas. Two of the world's most successful polo clubs are situated in Buenos Aires and South Africa has been privileged to host players from here many times in the past. And Argentina has been the world leader in polo almost uninterruptedly since the Berlin Olympic Games of 1936. South Africans will also remember the visits from Argentine rugby players the national side, the Pumas, first hit the headlines with the 1965 tour of South Africa. And several players, particularly that likeable halfback and captain Hugo Porta, have earned recognition as top internationals. But these lucky porteños of the capital, however, are also close enough to the sea to indulge in luxury sailing from Buenos Aires Yacht Basin, which is a major berthing facility for international sailors on the intercontinental yachting lanes. But it seemed ironic to us that there appeared to be such wealthy indulgence and good living in a country that has an unemployment rate of 15% and a foreign debt of about 35 billion rand. But for rich and for poor, the single most binding force is the church. Although some churches in this predominantly Catholic country have become status symbols in themselves, there's a 10-month waiting list for marriages in the ancient church of Santissimo Sacramento, one of more than 200 Catholic churches in the city. Most of the ornaments in this church are made of solid gold. Freedom of religion is a constitutional principle in Argentina, where even the most humble of church buildings are fine examples of early Jesuit, Italian, and other European designs. The churches have also prominently figured in the wars for Argentine independence, and some have the scars to prove it. This is a memento of an unsuccessful British military expedition to Buenos Aires in the early 19th century. Today, this church displays British flags captured in those early conflicts, engagements which 170 years later were to have a brief and tragic echo in the war against the British over the Falkland Islands. In a corner of the church, we found a historic Argentine prize that must still be a blow to British pride, 
a captured regimental flag. But all this does not detract from the love affairs that flourish in the city streets, the parks, the shopping arcades, the coffee houses, and the flea markets. These bargain corners for bric-a-brac of every description are always bustling with life. And instant entertainment, well worn though it may be. Not the last tango in Buenos Aires, but maybe one of the oldest. Although it's a city of commuters, Buenos Aires never sleeps. When the offices close and the sun goes down, the porteños and the tourists come out to look around the shops and maybe grab a quick snack. 10,000 restaurants and coffee bars begin to fill. It's a sign of hope for a vital nation that has seen tragedy in its recent history. The most immediate problem now for the new leadership is the country's growing international debt. So there is new life and love again in the capital city of the Silver Nation. And we can only hope that this man called Alphonsine might make the love affair last.